Self technology, the internet, GPS in the palm of your hand, autonomous operation. Technology is a driver of our times. Since its founding in 1958 in the midst of the Cold War, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has been a driver of technology. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's core of program managers. Their job, to redefine what is possible. My name is Ivan Amato, and I'm your DARPA host, and I'm thrilled to have with me today Dr. Stacy Williams, a program manager since 2019 in the agency's Tactical Technology Office. We are recording our conversation from our respective homes as we do our parts to slow the spread of COVID-19. Because we are not in a recording studio, you might hear ambient sounds like trucks and trains and birds and cicadas. Prior to coming to DARPA, Stacy worked for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, where she oversaw research in remote sensing for battlefield monitoring and in space situational awareness, which you will see applies to her work here at DARPA. She also worked on the Space Situational Awareness Challenge in Maui, Hawaii, as the Technical Advisor for Space Surveillance Systems for the Air Force Research Laboratory's Directed Energy Directorate. Early on for Stacy, chemistry was her thing, earning a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of California, Santa Cruz in 1993, and later doing pathbreaking work in the role of metallic atoms and proteins. As a faculty member in the Boston University Physics Department, she assumed research leadership positions and got a taste for the entrepreneurial culture in a startup company aiming to translate and transition basic R&D into commercial technology. Before pivoting into her Air Force R&D work, Stacy briefly stepped away from the lab to focus on improving science, technology, engineering, and math education, STEM education that is, especially in economically disadvantaged schools. For part of that time, she was a driving force in a Gates Foundation-funded program to deliver innovative, non-traditional teaching approaches for high-poverty school populations. She also got directly into the trenches by teaching in the Massachusetts Department of Education system. Stacey Williams, thanks for joining me in this conversation. Thanks for having me, Ivan. I appreciate it. First of all, congratulations on the placement of your new compact telescope demonstration project getting into orbit uh, just this past July 13th, uh, released from the International Space Station. So that is super exciting, and we'll talk about that and other projects in just a bit. But first, I'd like to hear a bit about some of the influences in your life that first sent you into a trajectory toward chemistry and protein science, but then more into optical physics and technology development directions. I've actually had a lot of people ask me that, particularly people developing um, STEM programs trying to target women or other underrepresented groups. And so I thought about that, and I don't really have an aha moment. But I will say that I've had a lifelong love of photonics, even when I didn't know what photonics was. That started out when I was a little girl in the South, and my yard in the evening would be full of fireflies. And I just was so enthralled with the bioluminescence, how something so small mm. could make you know, all of that beautiful light. I want to interject just for a minute for listeners who might not actually you know, sort of know what photonics is. Certainly the, the firefly example is a gorgeous one. Photons coming from the little lanterns of the fireflies into your eyes. Photonics is sort of a photon analog to electronics, right? So you're just thinking about light in terms of its wave nature and also its packet nature and photons. And it's, it's just sort of understanding those phenomena and how to manipulate them for potentially technological purposes. Yes. Uh, I guess fireflies are our little biological photonics. But I also, my parents took us, a uh, group of kids in my neighborhood, to a local natural history museum. And we went in there and, you know, looking at everything, I, um, I remember the, the mummy, because who doesn't remember their first mummy? <laughs> but then they took us into this room, and there was a bunch of rocks and a display case. And I was thinking, I've got rocks in my backyard, you know, who cares about looking at rocks? But then they turned the light on, turned on a black light, and the room was just lit up with fluorescence and phosphorescence. And I, and I just was just stunned by that as well. So I always loved science. I always was very curious. I, I think I drove my teachers crazy. So when I went to college and I took chemistry class and I learned about what fluorescence really was, what phosphorescence was, I just decided that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to work with light. I wanted to understand how light and matter interact. I wanted to work with lasers. So anyway, and then when I went to graduate school, I worked for a photochemist, photobiologist, photophysicist, studying the interactions, uh, well, light-initiated processes. So we use lasers to initiate a, a biologically relevant molecule to understand 
how that molecule took in the light and used it to do some type of function. You know, for example, in our eyes, we have rhodopsin that is a light absorbing protein that um, enables us to see light and dark. And so in, in all of my R&D that I've done since then has always involved some type of light initiation or being able to understand what's happening in a system that's distant, like a satellite, by using uh, light to uh, interrogate it. Mm, okay, so smitten by light early on, even as a child, <laughs> looking at uh, fireflies and then just developing that, that love you know, throughout your education and career and even now at DARPA. So cool to hear that. So now just before coming to DARPA, you had a similar research management role in the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, AFOSR. Uh, so what was the course of events that resulted in your arriving at DARPA headquarters a year and a half ago to start your tour as a program manager in the Tactical Technology Office? So when I was at AFOSR, I, well, and actually when I was at, in Maui at AFRL, I've, I've interacted a lot with DARPA over the years. The Tactical Technology Office, TTO, Fred Kennedy was the office director. He really wanted to be able to disrupt ISR satellites. And by ISR, just for listeners who don't know? Intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So those are our satellites typically in the low Earth orbit that provide weather information. They take pictures of the Earth. And they help us kind of understand, you know, what's going on with your space eye view. However, those systems are super expensive. You know, they can cost billions of dollars to put one of those up there. They're very exquisite. They give beautiful imagery, but they cost a lot of money. A group at Harvard that was actually funded by DSO, the Defense Sciences Office at DARPA, through the Extreme program, had developed a planar lens that could operate in the visible and was achromatic, so it could look at a, a wide range in the visible, 400 to 700-ish. And so Fred really wanted to bring that technology to bear on defense needs. And so they were looking for a program manager, and some of my colleagues just you know, mentioned, because I have a chemistry background, which Metamaterials is very heavily chemistry-based. We'll explain Metamaterials just in a little while, yeah? Yes. And I also have an optics background and a telescope background and you know, imaging background. And so I put together a pitch, and, and that's how I ended up at DARPA. Now what I want to do is really get back to that on-orbit project that I alluded to earlier, and it's called DEMI, short for Deformable Mirror. Uh, and it's right as we speak, right now orbiting, I'm not quite sure, a few hundred miles above in a CubeSat about what looks to me like the size of, a, of an old desktop computer. And so I'd like you to tell me about DEMI, you know, what capability gap it's intended to fill. Uh, I think you started to talk about that a little bit, the technology experiment that is now going on and what you hope will come out of this work in the long run. We're pushing to get lower cost systems. And when we have lower cost systems, typically we give up functionality. And so, you know, CubeSats are a lot, are very inexpensive, you know, relative to these you know, large single launch satellite systems. And so being able to do a proliferated system with that, um, you know, saves a lot of money. But the problem is, is that you lose functionality. Something that's that small doesn't really typically operate with something, you know, like the really large satellites that are like the size of a truck. And just when you say proliferated, you mean like there would be many, many platforms out there with these small platforms? Right, if you're dealing with something that costs billions of dollars, you have a few of them to monitor. But if you wanted to really have wide access to information over lots of areas, you need to have lots of these guys. And you can't just put a million billion dollar systems, right? It's just too expensive. And so we're looking for cheaper ways to be able to, to do that. And so what uh, Demi is, is it's a deformable mirror. It's a 6U CubeSat. And so it's 10 by 20 by 30 uh, centimeters cubed. And Demi is demonstrating a microelectromechanical system, so a MEMS deformable mirror. Deformable mirrors were actually developed for the ground-based telescope systems. So imaging objects in space from Earth is challenging because you have to go through the atmosphere. The atmosphere uh, will degrade your images. One kind of familiar example of what adaptive optics is supposed to try to deal with is, is sort of like the twinkling star effect, right? You see a star coming through and the atmosphere is doing things to the light as it comes through the atmosphere, and that makes it hard to actually do good telescopic imaging. Yes. Uh, but with adaptive optics using, in, in your case, these kinds of uh, deformable mirrors, uh, there's amazing technology to compensate for that, right? 
Exactly. And so what happens is your imaging and your with your large aperture telescope, you see something that looks like a cotton ball. And it looks like a cotton ball, like as you said, because the atmosphere is blurring that. And so deformable mirrors are mirrors that the shape deforms because you have actuators underneath there. And it measures what that blur is. We call it what the wave front is. And the mirror will deform to have that same blur, but exactly the opposite. And so you have something that looks like a cotton ball, you turn on your deformable mirror, it compensates for the blur and you get a, a nice image. <laughs> it's almost like two wrongs make a right. <laughs> exactly. So you may ask, why do I need a deformable mirror in space when I'm not looking through the Earth's atmosphere, right? Why do I need to do that? Well, deformable mirrors can improve other imperfections that you get from your optical system. So not, not just from atmospheric blur, but for example, in space, the temperature oscillates you know, dramatically. And every time that the temperature change, materials go try to get to equilibrium. So they change a little bit and that adds distortions into your imaging as well. And so what the system DEMI will do is it will measure what those distortions are in the optical system and then compensate for those so that we'll be able to see clearer images. We'll be able to have, for example, if, if you want to look at a small exoplanet next to a brighter planet, you need dynamic range to be able to differentiate those two. And so DEMI will enable us to be able to do that. So just want to stop you there because that's so cool. You know, exoplanets to me are just insanely interesting. And as far as I know, we, we haven't really directly imaged an exoplanet yet. I might be wrong there. I know we've detected them with various ingenious methods. Would your deformable mirror in sort of this distributed mode be able to create a telescopic technology to directly image exoplanets? Well, so that would be what the hope would be, to be able to do that with a smaller satellite. I'm actually not an astronomer, so my motivation is very different for that. But I can't talk about that here. Right. But what you can say <laughs> is overall, it's ISR, which we talked about intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. It's situational and awareness in space. So in general, it's like what's going on up there, what's there, what, what's happening. So uh, that's where, where this falls in. Right. So this is the first MEM system that's, that's actually working in space. And the students at MIT are actually communicating with the satellite now. They're going through the initialization, getting things started, and it's going actually really well. And this is a pathfinder. So if this system works, uh, this can help us with many different types of imaging applications. Maybe it could extend the range of a, of a satellite that's imaging other satellites in space, or it can you know, extend the range of you know, objects, dimmer objects that we can see. Also, as we have um, optical communications, it can also improve that. So anytime that you're transmitting and receiving light, this type of system will be able to improve the performance. Right. And just to give listeners a more sort of kinesthetic or physical sense of the mirror itself, I mean, how big is it? Is it the size of my thumbnail or is it something like that? Yep. It's about the size of a dime. A size of a dime. And is that just a test size or will you need to make larger deformable mirrors for the systems you envision? Well, yeah, it depends on what your application is, right? When you collect light into any kind of telescope, you have areas where you focus the light down into smaller points. So you don't need to have a gigantic deformable mirror. You know, it's not the same size as the aperture of your telescope. It's smaller. But uh, deformable mirrors come in all different sizes. When it comes to optical systems like telescopes, uh, lenses and focal lengths and other issues determine the overall size of the systems, other things, of course. I know you've been thinking about pushing the envelope of planar optics, and, and many of us have some exposure to this technology in the form of those flat magnifying sheets that can help you see small print on the pages, but you have something grander in mind. Yes. Well, so if, if you look at, at optics, you know, refractive optics, and look at telescopes made from refractive optics, they're not that much different than the telescope that Galileo developed. We've, we've, we've made a lot of strides in, in being able to, um, to lightweight some things, particularly for reflective types of telescopes, but we've kind of plateaued now. In the last couple of decades, we haven't made a significant leap. Um, and the reason for that is because currently we, we rely on naturally occurring materials to manipulate the light. And naturally occurring materials, the index of refraction is not that, there's not that much difference between air and glass type materials. And so what we do to be able to manipulate the light is we add a lot of bulk and we end up making optical systems. For example, when I was uh, working at the telescopes in Maui, 
you know, we would have rooms just full of optics, you know, trying to manipulate the light that we collected to be able to, you know, understand whatever we wanted to do about the, the satellite. Metamaterials, though, on the other hand, they're engineered materials and they can manipulate light in ways that you can't do naturally. And they've been the focus of a lot of research investment, particularly at DARPA in the Defense Sciences Office, as well as at the Air Force Office of Scientific Research and other places to mature and, and develop those optics. Stacy, before we move on, I just want uh, for people who, who haven't heard the term engineered materials and surfaces. So you're talking about surfaces that are made from parts or have textures that are very deliberately designed and produced. Yes. So what we're doing is we, we have a surface and we place uh, microfabricated sub wavelength structures. And what I mean by that is structures that are slightly smaller than the wavelength of light that it's manipulating. We identify what functionality do I want from this optic. And then I go in and engineer that and make that optic that has that functionality. That, that, that's where we would like to be. And metamaterials have the potential to be tunable, to be able to change the structure in real time so that I can change what functionality that specific optic has at that time. So that's you know what I came to DARPA to work on was to take that. So, so these metamaterials have been for longer wavelength systems and for single wavelength systems have matured significantly. If I want to do something in, in the visible, so light that's you know on the order of 400 to, to 800 nanometers, the structures are going to be smaller. And to do something that's broadband is more challenging too, because now I need structures that interact not only with light that's 400 nanometers, but that's 500, 600, 700. So it becomes a much more complicated problem. So I've been collaborating with my DSO colleagues, and we've been working on doing just that. And so we have several efforts that we're working on together to try to be able to take these metamaterials that have been demonstrated at the millimeter aperture size, so an optic that's a millimeter wide, but to take that and make that larger, to make that so that I can have a telescope that doesn't have 30 optics that are ridiculously heavy that really drive the cost of my ISR type system, but to have something maybe that only has a few optics, and those optics are about the weight of, you know, the magnifying films that you referenced. It reminds me a little bit of, you know, the kind of dramatic size reduction that we, we know of in the history, say, of computing, where you go from a you know, computer that takes up a room, and now we have in a chip, again, the size of a thumbnail, something, you know, thousands of times more powerful than that. So the same sort of capability, but in, in much more compact and practical forms. So that's in some ways what you're moving toward here? Yeah, so, so yeah, so that's what we're working on. So we're, as I said, my colleagues in DSO, we're also working with some of the other user communities to investigate, you know, can we make these metamaterial lenses have large apertures? Can we make them such that they are they function the way that we need to function, particularly in a space environment? And the, the other thing I think that's important too is, because uh, this is a very challenging problem, uh, but kind of understanding what the limits are of this. Originally, TTO wanted to be able to make a, a meter class ISR type satellite, but maybe maybe we're not close to being there yet. Maybe we can make something, though, that's 20 centimeters, which is, would also still have a huge impact. That's a very DARPA-esque question. You know, part of DARPA's mission, of course, is to sort of map out the landscape of what is possible. So what you might learn from the performers, that is to say the researchers working with you on this project, is, is just what are the limits of, of, say, you know, the size and extension and complexity that you, you, know, you can create with these metamaterials. So it certainly is spot on with the kinds of questions and answers DARPA is going after. So before we run out of time, though, I want to return to another part of your work life. And this is when you were uh, working on STEM uh, education. Again, that's, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math education, and especially in economically disadvantaged schools. I'm just wondering where the ad, that interest came from and if this is something that you're continuing to work on. Yeah, so I've been involved in STEM education for many years, and it, it kind of started when I was in, in college in the chemistry department. I was the president of our student organization, and we had lots of parents that were calling, wanting, you know, tutors. And so, you know, my fellow chemistry club members, we set up a free tutor center that where high school kids could come and then also college kids, and, you know, we tutored them in chemistry. And, and I have to say, I loved working with the high school kids. They had so many questions. They were so eager to learn. So I adopted two girls when they were in elementary school. 
and I wanted to have the same schedule with them. So I had always thought about, you know, teaching high school. So, but I made that transition then. And I did that in Boston and I just loved it. And then I was offered a position at the Dayton Early College Academy in Dayton, Ohio, to be the curriculum director for the Gates funded school that you mentioned. When I went to the school, it was it was in its second year, and and it was a, an amazing experience working there. the The first year, the folks that started it, teachers and administrators and community leaders, had researched lots of different creative solutions for urban education because at that time and you know probably still we have a lot of children that are graduating from high school that aren't at grade level that aren't really prepared for college or prepared for life and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation wanted to change this and so they funded several experimental schools across the country and one was the Dayton Early College Academy. And the idea behind DECA is, the, DECA is short for Dayton Early College Academy. These were first-generation college students. The students, 95% of them were on free or reduced lunch. 95% of the students were considered minorities. To take these students to get them ready for college. And so the, the model was, first of all, it was early college because a lot of students that, that graduate, particularly students from low-income families, they go to college and they can't, they don't test into the, the you know, official 1300 college classes. So they end up taking these remedial classes, but they're paying their college tuition. So they're accruing large debt, but getting zero college credit. And a lot of them get disenfranchised and they drop out. So this school has the students taking college while they're in high school to get them ready for that. And lots of the college classes were remedial classes, but that still helped get them prepared for the college classes. It's a very good model. The school is doing really well. We did realize early on that we really needed to start younger. So rather than starting at 14 each year, the school has added um, a, a middle school grade or uh, elementary. Now they go K through 12. But we also did a kind of a different way to approach learning. When you open up, you know, your high school chemistry textbook, the first chapter is on measurement. And that is the most boring chapter in the entire book. And I don't know why they just let me take all of your enthusiasm out of this class in this first week. So what we did was we took the students um, on an overnight camp trip. And we went to a camp that had a stream and the students collected water samples. They collected rock samples, leaf samples. And also during that time, they had the opportunity to bond with the teachers that they were gonna be spending a lot of time with because relationships were so important. I think when you have students in high school to get them really engaged in that. When we came back to the classroom, we spent the next few weeks understanding, you know, learning about measurement, learning about water quality, learning about the policies of water, learning about how water affects economics, how that affects, you know, where cities are built. And to do a kind of an integrated curriculum where we, you know, touched all of the areas. Stacy, that just sounds absolutely amazing. And I can tell that the combination of your knowledge and your enthusiasm must have just been a gift to the students. I have a prediction that at some point, you know, maybe not during your tenure as a DARPA program manager, but at some point you are going to get back into teaching because it just sounds like that's one place you know you want to be at some point. One more question, Stacy, before we close out here. You know, one of the phrases that often is associated with DARPA, you know, is that it's an important part of the overall innovation ecosystem, you know, which goes everywhere from uh, academics and laboratories to entrepreneurs. You had some experience of that already. I and mean, I'm just, now that you've been at DARPA for a little while, how do you view its place in the innovation ecosystem? Oh, well, I think DARPA is, a, is an amazing, incredible place. And I mean, one of the things I think that's most powerful is that we have technical program managers co-located with lots of the end users. So one of the things that I think is um, amazing about DARPA is the service liaisons. When I was in Maui, we developed technology, but we were very fortunate because we had end users embedded with us at the telescope side. And that was huge because the end users can really give you some guidance in, in developing something. Right. And just let me stop you just for a second. So, you know, for again, for listeners who might not know what that phrase service liaison mean. So at DARPA, there are men and women in 
uniform that come from the different services who you know have boots on the ground and experience in those services so that they can relay to the program managers and contribute to discussions with program managers about the kind of technology that really would uh, be valuable for the mission of furthering you know national security and defense. And they're invaluable. Like, for example, I have a, a small business innovation research program to develop wearable laser detection so that our dismounted soldiers, you know, will know if they're being lased. Well, I, I immediately talked to the end users that could potentially use this to understand if it's, you know, an inch, maybe if it's an inch square, that's too big for them. They can't have that. You know, they need you know, if it weighs a pound, no, it can't weigh a pound. It has to weigh a quarter of a pound. So these are really key pieces of information that you need when you're designing something. And so at DARPA, we just have access to, you know, amazing people that are, you know, have experience in the battlefield that come back and with enthusiasm share that with us and, and give us ideas for, for new things that need to be developed. So I, th I think that's, that's one of the most wonderful things about DARPA. Very cool to bring up. Again, it is just one element of many, you know, that make up, as some former DARPA directors have called it, its special sauce. What is it that makes DARPA uh, such a successful technology development institution? And, you know, a lot of people actually have tried to emulate it. People from all over the world have come to observe and try to learn what DARPA has been doing to, to see if they can learn lessons. But at the moment, there still is just one DARPA, as far as I know. Uh, so uh, thank you, Stacy. This has been uh, really cool to talk with you about your ongoing science and technology adventure and, you know, and how it's unfolding right here and now at DARPA. So thanks for sharing this time with me. Oh, well, thank you, Ivan. I've enjoyed our chat. And thanks, listeners, for sharing this time with us. I hope you join us again for the next Voices from DARPA. Thanks also to Ben Sullivan for his partnership in producing this program. For more information about Dr. Stacey Williams, the programs she runs at the agency's Tactical Technology Office, and the other breakthrough technologies DARPA is working on, visit DARPA.mil. And for links that enable you to download this podcast, go to the Voices from DARPA page on DARPA's website.